but we are very, extremely honored to be in Pastor Jensen's pulpit. Uh, we don't take this lightly. Well, anyway, praise God. Um, you know, it's interesting. If most of us go on a vacation, we will check out the sites, the hotels, the restaurants. We'll do some investigation. Yet most people will do no investigation on where they're going to go after they die. They put a great deal of effort into a short holiday and no effort into eternity. Why is that? I believe it's because most people tend to believe whatever they're raised with and not question it. But not questioning something, you can remain ignorant or uninformed. You could be on the wrong path. The wisest man that ever lived was King Solomon, except for Jesus. And he said in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So if you're here today and you're not familiar with the Bible and you don't really call yourself a Christian, we're here to share with you some information that will enable you to make an informed decision. So we ask you to simply remain open. Mark Twain even said, we're all ignorant and just about different things, right? And another wise man in our world today is Dr. Chuck Missler, a Bible teacher. And he said, the only sure barrier to truth is to assume you already have it. This, this is not a message of condemnation. This is simply a message of warning. You know, what loving parent wouldn't warn their child not to play in a busy street? Well, that's what God's doing. He's given us a warning. There really is a hell. It's far more horrendous than you can imagine. But it's your choice. You don't have to go there. Twelve years ago, when this experience occurred, I didn't really want to share it with anybody. I'm a conservative person by nature. I've been a real estate broker with my own company for 35 years. And to be identified with saying you've been to hell was extremely uncomfortable for me. I shared it with one close friend and my mother two weeks later. Well, it spread from there. We began getting invited all over the country. So for the next seven years, my wife and I, we would take her two days off a week and her vacation time, and we would travel to wherever we were invited. And we paid our own way. We never took any money from anybody for this for seven years. Then the publisher came to us after that time, which is about five years ago, and they asked us to write the book. So it was not something we wanted to self-promote in any way. But I was happy to write the book because I placed in there over 150 verses that talk about everything I'm going to tell you is already in the Bible. So if you're here today and you say, I don't know if I believe this guy, I'm not here to convince you to believe my experience. What I'm here to do is convince you to believe the Word of God. That's all that matters. Amen? So I'll quote some of the scriptures along the way, but I, I won't be able to give them all due to time constraints. But you might ask, Bill, how do you know this wasn't just a bad dream? There were three reasons, but just to give you one quickly. On the way back from this experience, I was traveling back with the Lord, which I'll tell you about. But we came above our home, and I viewed my body lying on the floor. So this was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that comes under the classification of a vision. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up in a, in a vision into heaven, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord just happened to show me that I left my body. And when I came back in, this body is not equipped to handle the horrors of hell. The, the memories and thoughts of hell flooded back into my mind, and I knew I was dying. And I went into a traumatized state, and I started screaming. And my screams woke up my wife, so I wanted her to share with you how she found me. Cer certainly. This was November 23rd, 1998, and we attended a... a prayer meeting every Sunday night. And there was nothing unusual about the evening. We never studied the topic of hell. We had both been Christians a long time. And we went to bed about 11, 11.30. And I woke to screams coming from our living room. And the first thing I did is I looked at our digital clock and it read 3.23. Bill awoke at 3 a.m. So that's where the 23 minutes in hell comes from. And I proceeded down the hallway and I found my husband in a state that I have never, ever seen him in. Anyone who knows Bill knows his nature is very calm and conservative, steady as he goes. So to see your husband in a fetal position on the living room floor with his hands to his temple and crying out in terror and torment was beyond shocking. I thought, is he dying? Do I need to call emergency services? And he began to cry out, pray for me, pray for me, the Lord has taken me to hell. And when he actually said those words, I felt a relief and a peace inside, and I know that was God. And I began to pray for him, and the Lord very, very graciously took the torment and the fear from his mind. But he left the memory of what had happened so he could share his story. And we just thank every single one of you here today. You're here by divine design. 
Give him hell, honey. Thanks, son. Nice guy. Isn't she gorgeous? Praise the Lord. She's even more beautiful on the inside, so praise God. I'm, I'm a blessed man. Anyway, you know, just to explain a couple things before I get into what happened. You might say, Bill, what about the rich man in hell in Luke 16? He asked Abraham, could you send back Lazarus to warn my brothers about this place? And Abraham said, even if one came back from the dead, they would not be persuaded. So, Bill, why would God send you? Well, two reasons I don't fit that scenario. Number one, I wasn't dead. I'm not coming back from the dead. This was just a vision. Number two, I'm not telling anybody to look at me and be persuaded. I'm just simply a signpost to point people to the scriptures and by those be persuaded. And in, but still, as a Christian, how can a Christian see hell? I've been a Christian for 41 years. This happened 12 years ago. Only in a vision, and in a vision you can travel like Paul and John did to heaven. And Ezekiel in chapter 8 and chapter 3, he was picked up by his hair and he was carried to Jerusalem. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness in his stomach and he wept, he conversed. My point is, in a vision you can enter into your spirit body. 1 Corinthians 15, talks about a natural body and a spirit body. And it's just as real as it would be in your physical body. And you can travel like they did. In Acts 12, 9, Peter, when he was released from prison, he was actually released, but he thought he was in a vision. So he couldn't even tell the difference in reality and a vision. So that's how real a vision can be. And this is not to compare my experience with any of these great men. This is just to give you an, uh, a scriptural basis for how this can occur. One more thing that was unique about this vision, God hid it from my mind that I was a Christian. He blocked it from my mind. You say, Bill, where's that in the Bible? In Luke 24, 16, Jesus, when he appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holden that they, that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary in Matthew Henry's says they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their mind. Other examples of this are in John 20, 14, Luke 18, 34, Daniel 4, 34, 2 Kings 4, 27. And this, I'm just giving an idea that God can block something from your mind if he wants to. Of course, we know he can do anything, but I'd like to give scriptural basis. And he did from mine for a reason which I will get to and explain. The last thing I want to say quickly before I get into it is, you might say, Bill, I'm a Christian. I don't need to hear about hell. Just three quick reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what we were saved from. Many Christians don't believe in a literal burning hell today. Many believe in annihilationism, which is a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus. That's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these shall go into everlasting life and these shall go into everlasting punishment. And he used the same word everlasting as the word ionios. So just as heaven is eternal, so is hell eternal. Many other verses, but so you will appreciate, thank God for what he saved us out of. Praise the Lord, amen. Number two, it'll cause you to walk more in the fear of the Lord. You know, a lot of the church today lives compromised lifestyles. They live in sin, and that should not be. Psalms 89, 7 says, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. And the word feared there is the word eris, and it means to shake in terror. You know, Moses was called the friend of God, and it says he shook and quaked exceedingly. So how much more are you and I? Now, I know we are to cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. But at first, we need to have a healthy, reverential fear of Almighty God and respect Him by not living in sin. And the fear of the Lord causes that. Proverbs 16, 6 says, By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And Jeremiah 32, 40 says, I will put my fear in their heart that they will not depart from me. So that's what the fear of God keeps you walking the straight walk. And it's His grace, anyway, that gives us the ability to be able to walk in, uh, in holiness and so forth. But the third reason is also it'll give you more of a passion for the lost, a desire to witness. You know, Bill Bright said only 2% of Christians even bother to witness. And that's sad because that's what we're called to do is be a witness. And, you know, in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, even though that scripture is talking about the judgment seat, the reward seat for Christians, most of the commentaries agree he was also talking about judgment and hell in general. So when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be more persuasive with men. And Ezekiel 33, 8 says, if we fail to speak to warn the sinner from his way, his blood will I require at your hand. That's a strong scripture. And it says the same thing in Acts 20, 26 and Acts 18, 6. Colossians 1, 28 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man. So it'll give you that passion, that desire to want to warn people. 
You see? So that's why it's important for us to know about hell. We went to a prayer meeting, like my wife said, came home, nothing unusual about the night. I've never studied the topic of hell, had no interest in it. We don't watch dark movies, nothing to do with that. I've never had a vision before. And I got up at three o'clock in the morning to get a glass of water. And suddenly I was pulled out of my body, like being sucked out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel. And it was getting hotter and hotter. And I entered into this open cavern area and then I landed on the stone floor in hell. I looked up and I saw these bars and these rough hewn stone walls. I was actually in a prison cell, filthy, stinking, dirty prison cell, uh, but like a dungeon. And um, I couldn't believe I was there. How did I get here? Why am I here? I was fully awake and cognizant. I was not dreaming. Isaiah 24, 22 says, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7.27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17.16 says they should go down to the bars of the pit. And I could keep going with the scripture, but this is where I could first found myself, was in an actual prison cell, and I was face down, and the heat was far beyond the ability to sustain life. And I wondered, again, how could I be alive in this heat? I noticed I could not hardly move. What's wrong with my body? But you have no strength in your body. And Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now that might not sound like a big deal, but if you ever had even the flu and you felt weak, what's well, a thousand times worse? Any movement takes tremendous effort. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, In him we live and move and have our being. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. I looked up and I saw these two enormous beasts in the cell. I didn't realize they were demons yet, but they were uh, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, huge jaw, sunken in eyes, and claws about a foot long. And these particular two are about 12 or 13 feet tall. And that's not an exaggeration. I could give you scripture for that too, but they were pacing in this cell like a caged, vicious animal. And they had this extreme hatred for God and they were blaspheming and cursing God. But we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm, Revelation 13, 6 and James 2, 7. And th they directed that hatred towards me. I thought, what have I done to them? But the one picked me up and threw me into the wall. I felt bones break, I collapsed. I couldn't believe I was living through this. I felt pain, but I understood most of it was being blocked. And the Lord explained on the way back, he allowed me to feel just a small amount of the pain so I could relate to people. It's not metaphorical or allegorical, a state of the mind. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. So the amount I felt was enough. The other one picked me up and, it, and just dug its claws in my chest and just tore the flesh open. I, I couldn't believe I was just existing through this. I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Remember Luke 16, the rich man had a tongue and eyes and so forth. You have a, a body, but it survives this. And I noticed there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. But Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says thy prisoners out of the pit where there's no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these creatures have absolutely no mercy over you. They hate you with an intense hatred. Um, and no mercy shown. But Psalms 103.17 says, the mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell. So you don't drive that benefit. About this time it went dark. Now I believe it was God's presence was there to illuminate it so I could see to describe to people what it looks like. But then it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. Lamentations 3.6 says, he has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 talks about blackness of darkness forever. But it's not just dark. You can feel the darkness. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 talks about a darkness that may be felt because there's only hatred and wickedness in this place. No love of any kind. The fear just penetrates right through your cell and the darkness and so forth, right through every cell in your body. And I was taken out of the cell, placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across. I just understood that. And there were flames raging high up into this open cavern, uh, literal flames. It was not metaphorical or allegorical. It was real literal fire. 
Psalms 11:6 says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. Psalms 140 verse 10 says, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49 mentions, the angels shall sever the wicked from the just and cast them in a furnace of fire. But it's real literal fire. And I just want to give you one verse to try to prove to you that it is. Um, because of the severity, you understand fire. In Revelation 9, 2, during the tribulation time when the bottomless pit is open, it says there arose a great smoke and our air and sun were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Well, it couldn't have been a metaphorical fire to produce real smoke. It had to be a real fire to produce that real smoke that darkened our sun. So it's real literal fire that you're going to experience in hell. And I, I could give you a lot more verses, but this is where I could first see people. There were people inside this pit, literally burning. It's the most horrible sight to see a person on fire. I'm telling you, most of us have never seen that. But their flesh was hanging off their bones. It was so awful to see it. Psalms 49, 14 says, their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. And they're screaming and burning. And I know this is awful, but I, I just need to get this across to you, how awful it is, the, the fires of hell. And the, the screams were so loud that the, I just wanted to get away from the sounds of the people screaming. But you can't. You have to endure this. You know, you ever heard somebody scream in a loud? It, it's, it's awful. There's millions of people screaming. It's deafening. But Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. No peace of mind of any kind. But again, Isaiah 32, 18 says that my people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not his people there, so you don't even derive being, you know, quietness. I understood I was down deep in the earth, and uh, there's over 49 scriptures that talk about where hell is located. And I just understood that I was down deep. And I'll just give you two, Ezekiel 26, 20, number 16, 32. But I just had, I descended to get there and I ascended when I left. And there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. I understood that. Now, I don't know what level I was in, but you remember Jesus said, Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation, inferring there's a lesser. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city, inferring there's a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28, how much worse of a punishment suppose it be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, there's a worse punishment. But my point is, there is no comfortable level in hell. It's all horrendous beyond anything you could possibly imagine. That's why Jesus warned about hell. 46 verses he gave about hell, and 18 of those verses are about the fires of hell. So he was warning us, there really is a hell. He doesn't want you to go there. And uh, I wanted to talk to my wife we're very close, and um, I knew I would never get to her again. She would never know where I was at. I could never, ever explain to her that I'm here for all eternity. And that thought alone was extremely tormenting to live with forever and ever. You'll never be able to tell her, and she'll not know where I'm at. I wanted to talk to a person, anybody, but you're denied that. You're kept in total isolation. Even though people are in the pit burning, they're kept apart. You're just alone by yourself. You don't get the pleasure of conversation with anybody and isolated. Uh, you have, it's just a useless wasting away. You have no purpose, no destiny of any kind. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, Your name is covered in darkness. You have no identity. No one would know who you are. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88, 12, Isaiah 26, 14. The smells in hell are so foul and putrid and disgusting, worse than any open sewer you can possibly ever imagine. And, but add to it sulfur. And you know, if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, you can't go past a certain point because the toxicity coming up from the volcano, which is sulfur, will kill you if you breathe it. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. So that's what you're breathing in hell, sulfur, and it's toxic. And I wondered, how can I be alive breathing this foul, putrid air? Remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. And, uh, but it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe. It's not like here where you take a nice deep breath. You don't get to do that in hell. You have to fight and gasp for even the tiniest bit of air. And I'll demonstrate to you, this is how you have to breathe in hell for all eternity. It's like... That was as much air as you could get. Well, you think, I'm going to die any second. I can't live with that amount of air. But that's the feeling you have for all eternity. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. 
It's turmoil and confusion. It's not orderly like we like things. Jeremiah 20, 11, Isaiah 45, 16, talk about a land of everlasting confusion. Uh, Job 10, 22 talks about a land without order. You know, we like things in order in life. It's chaotic and hectic and turmoil in hell. You need to sleep in hell, just like we need sleep here. I was only there 23 minutes, but I felt like I was there 23 weeks. And I was physically absolutely exhausted. I wanted to just rest my eyes or rest, but there is no form of rest ever. So for all eternity, you have to endure that. Just like here, if you were up two nights, you're pretty much a wreck after two nights. Well, that's how you're gonna be forever and ever, but it just keeps getting worse. And Revelation 14, 11 says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, no rest from the torments, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 said, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea's always moving. But again, that's a blessing from God to rest because Psalms 127, 2 said, it's the Lord that gives his beloved sleep. You're not his beloved there. I was standing next to this pit of fire and seeing people actually burn and demons tormenting people. It was the most awful sight to see people on fire again and, and burning and, and helplessly lost with these demons tormenting them. I was standing next to this pit of fire and I was beneath a cavern tunnel and all around the walls of the cavern walls were demonic creatures of all different sizes and shapes, twisted, deformed, grotesque, horrible looking creatures, no symmetry to their bodies, all one leg bigger than the other, one arm shorter than the other and so forth, uh, grotesquely ugly. Um, some were two and three feet tall, some were 12 and 13 feet tall. There were demons that looked like spiders that were three and four feet across. I'm not exaggerating. And you know, there's no scripture I can give you for spiders in hell, but in Revelation 9, it describes a demon coming out of the bottomless pit. And it's the most bizarre looking thing that uh, John tried to describe. But anyway, uh, there's snakes all over. There were snakes and um, maggots, maggots all over, millions of maggots. You know, where Jesus said, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And he personalized it with the, there, and he used the word maggot. So <clears throat> you actually have maggots on you. Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and will cover thee. It's the word maggot in the original. I mean, this is real. I learned this from John MacArthur's teaching on hell. And he said that, you know, if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, I know this is disgusting, but just bear with me. If its flesh is being eaten by maggots, after the flesh is consumed, the maggots die. I never realized that, but they will die after the flesh is consumed. That's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed. So as Job 24, 20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee for all eternity. Is that disgusting enough? You're hungry, you don't get to eat in hell ever. We just went off a 21 day fast, you know what it's like. Never eat again, ever. Imagine, you don't get to drink just one drop. If I was to give you a drop of water, it wouldn't suffice, would it? Wouldn't, wouldn't help you. But in hell, you do anything for that drop of water. Anything, like the rich man wanted that drop. He's still waiting for that drop 2,000 years later. You'll never get it. The fear level in hell is so far beyond anything you can possibly imagine. And all of us have gone through some kind of fear in life. Maybe you're in a car accident. Remember the moment before the impact, the fear that would jump up in your throat? Well, if you can take that times again a thousand and just hold it there. And I'm gonna share with you an experience that I had so you can understand what the fear is like. I used to surf a lot when I was 17 and a uh, hundred guys were out that day. Anyway, long story short, I was on my board and a, and a 10 foot tiger shark came by, bit my board in half, I was in the water, then he came back and he grabbed my leg and pulled me down under the water. Now, if you know anything about sharks, tiger sharks are about the most vicious shark. They don't let you go. And so now my leg was in his mouth 
and I'm under the water. Now you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment, right? You can at least relate to that. Well, that fear paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. Wouldn't even register. But praise God, the shark opened its mouth and let me go. That's a miracle of God. Amen? Praise God. And even more of a miracle, I didn't have one mark in my leg. That's impossible. God was looking out for me then. I was not a Christian then, but I got saved immediately after that. So, <laughs> it was God. Thank God, I still got my leg. Thank you, Lord. But you might say, Bill, why is hell so horrible? Why would God make such a horrible place? Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go there, number one. It's for the devil, not for man. But the word prepared there is the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven, make ready. Well, in that preparation, what he did was, you see, James 1, 17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So every good thing we enjoy is from God. So what God did was he simply withdrew his attributes. He withdrew his goodness from hell in the preparation. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1, 5 said, God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said, God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said, God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 said, the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said, it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11:11 11, 11 said, water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says, he is the prince of peace. Praise God. So you, you see, if, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. There is no good thing apart from God. So if you're a person that says, I don't, I don't want God in my life, well, there is a place prepared that has nothing to do with God. Can you see why hell's so horrible? He's withdrawn his attributes. So when people look at the green tree and the oceans and the sky and they say, oh, isn't Mother Nature wonderful? No, that's not Mother Nature that provided that. That's Father God that provided that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I began being raised up this tunnel and into absolute darkness. And then suddenly, this bright light appeared. I knew immediately who it was. And I said, Jesus. Jesus. I, I didn't see his face. I just saw an outline of a man standing in this bright, pure, holy light, like no light I've ever seen. And I fell at his feet. I felt like I died. I don't know what happened there, but in Revelation 1.16, John, when he saw me, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and he fell at his feet as one dead. Anyway, after a time, he touched me, and thoughts I came to, and it was there at his feet that I realized that because he went to the cross, I didn't have to go to this place. I was so grateful for the cross. I was so thankful for what he did for us. <laughs> Praise God. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just wanted to worship him. All you want to do is worship him in his presence. I just said, thank you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for the cross, Lord. I just kept repeating that. And, but after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind, and he would answer my thoughts. You know, Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I thought, Lord, why'd you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. That statement surprised me. I thought all Christians believe in hell, but we have found out since many Christians don't. They believe in universalism, annihilationism, soul sleep, all kinds of things, but hell is real. I thought, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? And he said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. These demons hate you. And I thought, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. That's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. And I said, Lord, why did you pick me? But he didn't give me an answer. So I have no idea why he picked me. I'm the least likely, in my opinion. I just was a realtor going to work every day, like the rest of us. I was not a Billy Graham. Uh, you know, I like things really neat and clean and perfect. I know we all do, but I'm like a fanatic about these things. And, 
hell is the antithesis. And, uh, I mean, I don't even like the summertime. That's too hot for me. But, but you know, it doesn't matter why. He's given us all a job to do, and there is nobody more important than anybody else. We all need each other. We all have a job to do. But you know, I felt very uncomfortable giving this for seven years. I, I get sick to my stomach. I didn't want to go. I complained. And I never liked public speaking and all these things. But I said, you know, Lord, I don't like being identified with saying you've been to hell. People think you're crazy. And, um, you know, he said to me, Bill, you know, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. I said, yes, sir. I'll go. Praise God. I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? Why didn't I know you? He said, because if you would have known me, you would have had hope. You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but he hid it from me, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of this place, right? I would have known that. But as an unsaved person, he wanted me to experience what they feel there, hopelessness. And none of us in life here have any idea what that's like to be hopeless. I mean, your situation might be awful, but you can always die to get out of it. In hell, you can't. Your soul lives on for eternity because we're made in God's image. You can't ever get out of it, and that by far was the worst part. Understanding that 10 million years will go by, it doesn't matter, I'm still there. There's no angels to come rescue me, there's no friend, there's nobody's gonna come get you out. There is no help you're gonna ever get. Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. There is no other way, but for those people there, it's too late. The decision's final. We went above the earth's surface and um, we came out of this whirlwind tunnel, Isaiah 40, 24, and so forth. But he had me see people falling back down this tunnel we just came out of. There was one after another after another falling back down this tunnel. And God allowed me to feel a piece of his heart. And he wept when he saw people falling into hell. And I said, Lord, I can't even stand to feel a piece of the anguish you feel of your creation going into hell. I can't stand it, stop. And you know, his love passes knowledge. Ephesians 3.19 says he loves us far more than we can even conceive. He doesn't wanna see one person go to this place. That's why he wants us as Christians to go witness, open our mouth. We have the words of life to share with people. He's the giver of life and he wants people to live and not go to this horrible place. But you might say, Bill, I'm a good person. I'm not gonna to go to this place. That's the common misconception. People think if you're a good person or do good works, you're gonna to get to heaven. It's not based on being good. Because see, your standard of good and God's are two different things. Heaven and God are perfect. And James 2.10 says that we offend the law in one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. If we steal one thing, 1 Corinthians 6.9 says, no thief will inherit heaven. If we have one lustful thought, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery and no adulterer will inherit heaven. So if we're gonna be judged by that standard, would we be guilty or innocent? We would all be guilty. None of us can stand there and say, I'm pretty good, Lord, let me into heaven. Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. So that's how we look to God. So praise God, it's not based on that being good. But, in, but you might not be convinced yet. You might be like a radio talk show host that I was on with, Secular, and he said, Bill, I'm a good person and my viewpoints uh, I, I, I'm justified in my viewpoints, even though I, I don't agree with you Christian, you Christians. I have a legitimate viewpoint, and I'm a good person. I believe I should go to heaven, and if your God doesn't let me go to heaven, he's guilty of a hate crime, and I believe he should be arrested and thrown in jail. That's what I think of your God. I said, well, okay, you think you, you're good. You, need to go, you should go to heaven? And he goes, that's right. Well, God gave me an analogy to give him on the air. I said, well, say you uh, went and found the most expensive home in the country, and you knocked on their door, and you said, uh, excuse me, I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? And you wouldn't expect them to. You have no relationship with them. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as a son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door and demand to live at his house. You don't even know him. You have no relationship. See, God is your creator, but he's not your father until you invite in Jesus as your savior. You see that? Galatians 3.26, John 1.12, John 8.44, John 17.9, Romans 9, 7 and 8, all explain that he's your creator, but he's not your father. So you have no right to live at his house. That's arrogant to expect to live at someone's house that, when you don't know the person. He says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right, and I think all roads lead to God. That's what I think. 
And I said, well, let me give you another analogy because he didn't want me to give scripture. I mean, you can't give scripture on secular air. They throw you right off. So God gave me an analogy and I said, well, say you invited me over to dinner and you told me, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. That's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I think I'm gonna go north on 95. I'm gonna get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. <laughs> well, you're gonna tell me, Bill. You're going to say, Bill, you're not going to get to my house. I'm trying to give you clear directions. The same way God gives us clear directions to his house. I think God knows where he lives. Amen? All we have to do is follow his directions. That's not being narrow-minded. He's being specific. He's given you specific directions how to get to his house. He's not trying to keep you out. You know, it's not God up there saying, oh, I think this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. It's not that way. All of us above the age of accountability are automatically on that road to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 explain that. We're condemned already because of sin. So he's not sending you. You're already going there. That's why he came, was to get you off that road. All you have to do is look to the cross. He says, well, can't God overlook my sins? I mean, okay, I'm a sinner. I don't kill anybody. Can't he overlook my sins? I said, no, he can't for two reasons. Number one, he's a just judge. And a good judge in our land cannot be considered good if he lets the criminal go free. Right? He has to punish the criminal. Uh, well, the same way, God has to punish the sin. But he took out that punishment on Jesus. But if you don't want to take it, and you deny Jesus, then you take the punishment. It's your choice. But you can never pay for sins, because only the blood of Jesus can pay for sins. Time would never suffice. Because when you came out of hell, you'd still be a sinner. So if you said, oh, I paid off my 200 years in hell, you would still be a sinner. So, and time, time would be works. And it says we're saved by grace, not by works. So that doesn't work. But also another reason is Hebrews 12, 29 said God's a consuming fire. Nahum 1, 5, the same thing. And what that means is say I stuck my hand into the fire to retrieve something and the fire burned me. I wouldn't say, why'd that fire burn me? That was mean of that fire. I didn't do anything to that fire. I wouldn't say that, would I? Why? Because the nature of the fire is to burn. Well, God's nature is to consume sin. So see, a holy God and sinful man are not compatible, just like your hand and the fire are not compatible. If we show up in God's presence the way we are, we would be consumed because of his very nature. So how can man ever show up in God's presence? Only one way. We would have to appear to be sinless. Well, how can that happen? Only one way. If someone came and lived the perfect life and never sinned once, that someone is Jesus Christ. And he stands there before the Father and he says, I've never sinned. I'm going to exchange my righteousness, my right standing for their sin. I'm going to take their sin on my body. If they would trust in me and not their works, Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So if we trust in what Jesus did and not our own works, then he considers our trust as righteousness. And he gives us his righteousness, takes our sin, washes it away with his blood. Now we can stand there and appear to be sinless because our sins are dealt with. Isn't that an awesome plan that God came up with? <laughs> Praise God. But you might say, I don't like this one-way business you Christians have. You ought to be grateful there is a way, that God made a way. He made a way where there was no way. But you know, God loves you, and that's why he gave you a free will to choose. It's up to you. But just know this, in Revelation 21, 8, he said, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So if you say, Bill, I don't believe that, well, he just told you where you're going to end up. So you send yourself to hell, your own words will condemn you, as Jesus said. He's not sending you, your own words condemn you. It's your choice. He loves you and he doesn't want you to go there. Your soul is eternal and it's so precious to God. It's so valuable. So this is the clear directions to heaven I want to give you. John 3.36 says, if He that has the Son has everlasting life, but he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You have to know the Son. How do you do that? Just two verses. Luke 13.3, Jesus said, Unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. We have to repent. And all repent means is to be humble enough to admit, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I want to turn away from my sin. I want to follow Jesus. 
Now on your own, you can't walk away from sin, but with the Holy Spirit and God's grace, he empowers you to be able to walk away from sin. You just have to be willing right now to say, I wanna turn away from my sin and repent. I'm sorry for my sins. That's repentance. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe in your own heart and confess it with your own mouth. That's the clear directions to heaven. There is no other way. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you want to live at his house, you do it his way. So my last scripture for you tonight is, or today, Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. He has a book. And wouldn't it be awful to stand there before him and him say to you, your name's not in this book. Depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what he would have to say. He doesn't want to say that. But you have to make the decision here, right now, why you have the opportunity. Because I'm telling you, one second after you die, it's too late. There is no appeals court. There's no friend that can save you. There's no angels to protect you. You die alone. And it's going to be too late then. And if you leave here today and you say, I'll think about it tomorrow, your heart grows harder. And it's harder to reach you. So there's more chance of you not getting saved. And you don't know that you'll have tomorrow. So my question for you tonight is, do you know if your name is written in his book? You have to know this. You have to be positive of this one. If you have any doubt whatsoever, you need to know today. And you can know that right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you would say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book. I'm not certain. And I don't know if I've ever really repented. You can be certain right today. And you need to be. If you, if you have any doubt at all in your mind, any doubt, I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand. Anybody here that wants to know Jesus and you don't know if your name's in his book? Then raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. All over, I see hands. Raise your hand, raise your hands. Raise them up high. Don't be embarrassed. He hung naked on a cross for us. You want to be certain of this one that he writes your name in his book. If everybody would stand. I'm gonna challenge you, any one of you, rose your hand, lifted your hand up, I'm gonna ask you to come forward. Get out of your seat right now. Come on down to the front. Give us the privilege of praying with you. Make your way down. Anybody, if it's in your mind, if you're not positive, Please don't leave here. Please don't leave here. Make your way down to the front. Get out of your seat, come on down. If you're in the overflow room, make your way down. Wherever you're at, come down to the front. Take a stand for Jesus. Show them you mean business. You're making a commitment today. This is the most important decision you could ever make. Keep coming. Keep making your way down. Anybody else? Keep coming. God's so proud of you coming down here. But your name is going to be written in his book today. That's an awesome thing. God's got this big book. And your name will be in there. Praise the Lord. 
I mean, there's nothing better than having your name in his book. Praise God. I'm just going to wait another minute. If there's anybody else, if you even have the thought, you're thinking, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do this. I'm going to think about this later. Please do not leave. Just one soul is so precious to God. All of heaven celebrates over your one soul. So please come down here. Praise God. We're just going to wait another 30 seconds. Maybe we can sing a song. Praise God. Praise God. This is a beautiful sight. Amen. Praise God. All right, we're going to say a prayer. If there's anybody else, last few seconds, come on down. Please come down. We're going to say a prayer that's going to change your entire eternity. You're gonna repeat this after me, but it's really coming from your heart. You're just simply asking God to forgive you and inviting him into your heart. I just feel in my heart there's somebody, there's one person. You're just resisting God. That's the Holy Spirit telling you. Don't fight him. He has a wonderful life for you and he wants to take you to heaven. There's somebody, I know, there's somebody. Please come down. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. just waiting another minute you know one person is so precious to God one soul 
just giving it another minute for all of us to wait another minute. I appreciate your patience, but there's nothing more important than somebody's soul. Praise God, amen? All right. I feel better. I knew there were some people holding out. All right, praise the Lord. Are you guys ready to pray this prayer? All right, we can all say this, all right? Say, dear God in heaven, I know that I have sinned and I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me, that he was crucified and he died and was buried. But he rose again and he lives forevermore. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins. I repent. I turn away from my sins. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. I ask you to come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. You died for me. It's your shed blood that washed away my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I declare that I am now a born-again Christian. Go into heaven, and I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor.